So now let's look at how the calibration can be done. We assign a frame on the 3D image pattern, uh, which is a square, and we'll simply call this uh, 0, 0. Uh, and if this is the x-axis, we'll call this 1, 0, and 0, 1, and 1, 1 over here. So we'll simply assign a set of coordinates on the 3D imaging device uh, up to scale. Notice that the scale here is not important. This is because, after all, what we want to find would be the homography that re relates the trans projection of the imaging device onto the image, the corresponding points over here. And this denotes by H. And we have seen earlier on that uh, we want to make use of this uh, homography over here to project the circular points at the plane of infin at infinity onto the image. And we have seen in the previous lecture that the circular points I and J, they are invariant to similarity transformation. And hence, uh, the absolute scale of this coordinate is not, is not important. So suppose that we are looking at only one of them and we assign this uh, coordinate frame, we can identify the corresponding corners uh, of this particular imaging device on the image. And th given this set of correspondence, four correspondences, we can easily compute the homography in a linear uh, algorithm. Uh, let's look at just one of the imaging device that we have seen earlier on. So this guy here is going to be uh, related use, uh, with this uh, using a homography that we rewrite as uh, H1, H2, H3, where H1, H2, H3 is the respective, they are the respective columns of the 3 by 3 homography matrix. And we're going to apply uh, this onto the circular point I and J, which is on the plane at infinity via this particular homography. And we can see that uh, according to the definition in the previous lecture, that uh, the circular points is defined by 1 and plus minus i, which is the co a complex number, and 0, since it lies on the plane at infinity. And we've applied h on this pair of circular points, we'll essentially get this relation here. This, which is the, this relation over here is simply the image of the circular point onto this particular image that's related by this particular homography uh, over here. Since we know that this particular image circular point uh, is going to lie on the image of the absolute conics, because since the circular point lies on the absolute conics, which is projected onto the image as the image of the absolute conics, although we cannot observe this physically, we also know that the so two circular points must also be lying on this uh, image of the absolute conics. And hence, we can rewrite this into this equation because omega here is a conics, and we know that any point that lies on the conics must fulfill this particular equation over here. Hence, we can uh, rewrite this into this relation, which can be decoupled since this is h1 plus minus i of h2. So this can be decoupled into two equations. The first equation here is, uh, it would be h1 uh, transpose multiplied by uh, h2 equals to 0. And the second equation here would be simply h1 transpose omega h1 equals to h2 transpose omega uh, h2. Once this simply means that one pair of uh, circular point, which means that there are two circular points i and j here, it's going to give us two constraints. Essentially, this is equals to 0. We can also make this equals to 0 by simply taking h2 transpose omega h2 cross product with h1 transpose omega h1 equals to 0. So both of these equations are linear uh, with respect to omega in the terms of omega. And altogether, we have six unknowns in this particular uh, image of the absolute conics because this is a conic, which is a semantic trigger metric that consists of six unique entries. Altogether, we will need five or more uh, equation since this is up to scale. We only have five degrees of freedom. We'll need five or more such equations to uh, solve for the, the conic. And this simply means that uh, we'll only need six of such constraints, which comes from three unique homography that can be computed from three of these uh, squares uh, placed in uh, uh, any, any configuration except for they cannot be lying on a parallel uh, plane. Once we get the image of the absolute conics by simply solving for omega in this linear equation, we can restack really this into a w equals to zero, for example, and solve for the unknowns inside here. 
And then once we solve for the unknowns, we can reshape it into omega a three by three matrix, that such that taking a Kolisky factorization of this would be able to recover the uh, intrinsic value of the of the camera matrix. And here's an example. After uh, doing this, we can see that this is the result that we can get. And uh, another property, another interesting thing about the image of the absolute uh, conics is that since this is a, the image of the absolute conics is that since this is a conic, it should also re, uh, it should also obey the pole polar relation. Suppose that we have two image points that back projects to octagonal ray. These two image point, uh, points here, and if they back project to octagonal rays, they are going to be related uh, with respect to omega uh, you, with this particular constraint here that actually comes from the pole, uh, polar relation. So if I have a point x1 that lies outside the conics, I will be able to draw two tangent lines that meets the conics that and if I join the two tangent line this is so this would become the my pole uh, this would become my pole and this would become the polar line that is another point that is lying on this polar line that is a conjugate to my pole what this simply means is that if I were to do this and uh, lying on this tangent points uh, the original point x1 would be lying on the polar line that is defined by x2 and these two conjugate points are related via this uh, equation over here so similarly if uh, i have a point which is uh, which i call x and this particular point is perpendicular is octagonal to the vanishing direction where x2 lies on earlier on that we have seen uh, so this will directly define the pole polar equation, which is L equals to omega x. In this case here, uh, this would be the vanishing direction and this would be, this could be a vanishing point that is octagonal to the vanishing direction. And since x lies outside the conics, you would have a polar line, which we call L over here. And this is the pole. And these two are related by this equation. So I'll give more in detail about the pole polar relation in the next few slides, we have seen in lecture one that the uh, this equation L equals to C X is uh, the relation of a tangent line and the point that is uh, lying on the tangent of the conic with this tangent line L. We call this uh, point X and the conic C over here. If x transpose c x equals to zero this means that the point x must be lying on the conics uh, at the same time but uh, in the case where x transpose c of x is not equals to zero this means that we have a point x which is not lying on the conic c but this particular relation l equals to c x can still lie uh, true and uh, we call this line over here the polar line instead of the tangent line. And geometrically, this is what it means. Suppose that we have a, a point X over here. The line uh, L is the line where it's uh, passing through two of the tangent points, where each one of the this tangent point here, it's uh, a result of the tangent line that passes through this tangent point and the point X. So uh, we have two of these points that passes through the tangent line and the point X. And uh, the line that is uh, spanned by these two tangent points over here, which we call L, is given by C multiplied by X here. And this particular line here, we call it the polar line. Uh, the, the remark here is that if the point X is on C, then the polar line becomes the tangent line because in this case here uh, x transpose c of x it would be equals to zero and this holds true this means that the polar line will become the tangent line in this case here here's the proof of the polar line consider that we have uh, two points denoted by z1 and z2 uh, here uh, on the conics and these are the 
two points z1 and z2 here are the two points that is uh, uh, on the tangent line and the conics respectively and uh, the lines this tangent lines here we denote it as l1 and l2 respectively and these are given by c of uh, z1 and c of uh, z2 and in these two cases here z1 c or z1 transpose c z is uh, one is going to be equals to zero as well as uh, z2 uh, transpose c z2 is also going to be zero the reason is because z1 and z2 are on the conic and the point x would be equals to l1 cross l2 uh, this is according to what we have seen earlier uh, it, and it is the intersection of the two lines or two tangent lines l1 and l2 putting l1 equals to c z1 and l2 equals to c z2 into this uh, cross product here we will get this expression over here where we can see that simply we can uh, factorize out c and the factorization of this cross product here would uh, result in the determinant of c multiplied by c inverse transpose uh, multiplied by the cross product of z1 and z2 where c inverse transpose is simply equals to uh, c inverse since c is a symmetrical uh, matrix and l equals to z1 cross z2 so this guy here is simply equals to l and uh, finally we end up with this expression here uh, where x is equals to the determinant of c c uh, inverse multiplied by l and this would be equals to kc inverse l where we simply uh, take the determinant since this is a scalar number we simply call it a constant uh, scale of k here multiplied by c inverse l and this simply means that l is equals to c of x since uh, you know, the scale here doesn't matter we, we can put c inverse here onto this side of the equation together with x and hence we'll get l equals to cx here where l here is our polar line so now let's look at more details on the definition of the conjugate points uh, if the point y is on the line lx equals to cx this means that uh, it lies on the polar line of x the pole of uh, x then uh, y transpose lx would be equals to y transpose cx equals to zero and any two points x y satisfying y transpose cx equals to zero are conjugate with respect to the conic c the conjugate C relation is symmetrical. What this means is that if X lies on the uh, pole or polar of Y, uh, then Y is on the polar line of X. We can see geometrically this is what it means here. So uh, Y here it's lying on the polar line LX of the pole X over here. So what this means is that X must also lie on the polar line of y which is l y over here so the geometrical construction we can see that this is true by the way this construction the figure here is constructed to uh, scale and everything here is accurate you can uh, verify this for yourself and the proof here is that the point is on the polar of y if x transpose c y where c y here is simply the uh, polar line of y we denote as l y and if x is on this polar line then uh, this relation the incidence relation must hold true to be equals to zero similarly uh, the point of y is on the polar of x this means that uh, cx here which is the polar line lx of the pole x and y if it is on this polar line of x then the incidence relation of y transpose lx must be equals to zero and since uh, x transpose cy equals to y transpose cx which is equals to zero if one form is zero then so is the other what this means is that if we compare these two equations over here we can see that y and x are actually interchangeable hence there is a dual conjugacy relation for lines two lines and uh, l and m are conjugate if l transpose c star m equals to zero so uh, let's give a more formal 
definition uh, of the vanishing points uh, here. So geometrically, a vanishing point of a line is actually obtained by the intersection of the image plane with a ray that is parallel to the world line and passing through the image center. So what this means is that let's say if I have a line, this particular line over here, uh, which I call uh, X. So uh, the vanishing point that is formed on the image. So every point here on this line is going to project onto the image plane, which is denoted by this line over here. Uh, it's going to be uh, projected onto the respective points over here. So one of these points it's going on the image is going to be the projection of the infinite direction of this line. And that's the vanishing point, which we call uh, V over here. So this particular point is actually defined by simply drawing a line that starts from the camera uh, center and pointing in a direction that is parallel to the real 3D line and the intersection here to the image plane would be what we call the vanishing point. So now let's look at another image plane here. Uh, it would be simply the same thing. If I don't move the, the camera center and simply just rotate this, uh, we'll see that th the direction at infinity of this line here is simply projected onto another vanishing point, which we call V prime on the uh, another image, which we call X prime over here. So uh, thus, a vanishing point depends on only the direction of the line and not the position of the uh, of the line. So uh, because we are only looking at the parallel direction here uh, in this case. And consequently, a set of parallel lines will have a common vanishing point. What this means here in the in the 3D sense is that uh, regardless of this line over here or this line over here or this line over here, uh, it's always going to, because it's uh, the vanishing point is simply uh, defined as the intersection of the line that starts from the camera center and parallel to all these lines, which is this light ray, which is this ray over here. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter where this, the position of these uh, lines are, it's always going to have the same parallel point and uh, it's al always going to have the same vanishing point. And as a result, what we can see here is all the parallel lines, when you image it onto the image scene, so this is what we are going to get. All the parallel lines, they will converge at a certain point, they will intersect at a certain point, and that point is what we call the vanishing point. So any two vanishing point would give us the vanishing line. Now, algebraically, the vanishing point can be obtained as a limiting point as follows. Suppose that we have a 3D line uh, that lies uh, in the 3D world, and uh, we can parameterize this uh, 3D line using the direction as well as any point on this 3D line. So the set of points that lies on this 3D lines, which we denote as x lambda over here, is going to be equal to any point on the line plus a scale multiplied by the direction of the line. So any point here would be given by this particular uh, equation. Now, suppose that uh, we have a projective camera. This is canonical uh, projective camera, which is given by this guy over here. We're going to project every point on the 3D line that we have defined earlier on, which is x lambda uh, by the camera projection. So we are going to take x multiplied by lambda. And this we can see that is essentially equals to p multiplied by a plus lambda of uh, D, which is the directions that we have, and we can evaluate this by simply pulling out. We have seen this earlier on, and this PA over here would be simply the projection of the point on the 3D line, and PD would be simply the projection of the direction of the line in, in 3D space. And so once the vanishing point is defined as a point where lambda here, so suppose that just now we have seen that there's a line, so a point A. And then lambda simply, uh, there's a direction D. Lambda is simply the the scale of this uh, or the magnitude of this guy over here you know, along the line. So suppose that this lambda approaches infinity. What we are looking at would be a point at infinity that is in the direction of this line. So now let's take the projection, uh, which is given by x lambda over here that we have found earlier on. 
uh, and limit this to infinity. Uh, what we'll get is k multiplied by d. So this can be easily seen by here. Uh, let's take this divide by lambda and then k d. So if we limit this guy to infinity, this guy goes to infinity and this whole term here will tend to zero, will approach zero. Hence what we were remaining would be k multiplied by the lambda here goes to infinity. So uh, as a result, we can see that the vanishing point is pretty much only dependent on the camera intrinsics as well as the direction of the line and is not specified by any of the direction. That means at any location of the 3D points on the line, which is uh, what we have claimed earlier on uh, geometrically. Now, the, in, in 3D projective space, the vanishing point is simply the image of the intersection of the plane uh, at, uh, at infinity and a set of lines uh, in the same direction. What this simply means is that I have a plane at infinity and a set of parallel lines, and they are all going to converge. They are all going to converge and intersect the plane of infinity at the infinite point. And the, this particular point at the plane of infinity is going to be mapped onto the image as the vanishing point. And this is essentially uh, given by this equation here, which is uh, what we have derived earlier on using the limiting point. But we can also define it uh, based on this uh, equation over here. So essentially, the, the point that is infinity, is, it, it can be expressed as, this point at infinity can be expressed as just the direction just the single direction because all the parallel lines are pointing towards the same direction. So they are given by this direction and the last uh, entry here is going to be zero since they are parallel uh, lines that uh, since this is an intersection uh, at the plane of infinity, hence it's an ideal point. So by substituting this into x infinity and the camera projection multiply pre-multiplying it by the camera projection matrix, what we are going to end up with would be the same equation that we have seen earlier on here. And uh, note that the set of line parallels to the plane are also imaged as a parallel line. This means that the, the vanishing point will still be uh, at the point of infinity. However, the converse might not be true if we observe a set of parallel lines on the image. Uh, this doesn't mean that in the real world scene, this is also a set of uh, parallel lines. Th this is because uh, we have seen earlier on, uh, if this is the camera center, we have uh, what we call the uh, principal plane that essentially lies on the XY plane of the uh, camera, local camera coordinate frame. And any points, any uh, lines that lies on this plane, it's a line at infinity. Essentially, this means that Z here equals to zero. And any intersection of these two lines it's also it's always going to give us a line that uh, is at infinity. And the projection of this point here onto the image plane is always going to be ending at a point at infinity because this is uh, going to be with a Z of zero. The projection means that this point here is going to be ended up, projected onto the image at, a, in, in, at infinity. And what this means is that these two lines, although that the lies on the principal plane, although they are not parallel, they are going to be imaged as parallel on the image because the intersection of this point, the two lines, which is this point over here, is going to be, be imaged to infinity. Now let's look at an example where we can make use of the observation of the vanishing points on images to uh, estimate the relative rotation between two camera views. Uh, that let's denote the first camera view as uh, p equals to uh, k multiplied by identity and zero, which is in, in the canonical frame, i and zero over here. And the second frame is, let's denote it by p prime, where basically the camera intrinsics remains the same. Let's assume, make the assumption that the uh, it has the same camera uh, intrinsics. But now, this part, the second view is rotated and translated by a certain amount. In this example, if we can observe the vanishing point, that means that the projection of a point at infinity on the first image, let's denote by V, and on the, the projection of the same X at infinity on the second image, which we denote by V prime, if we can observe these two points over here, if we can do, uh, observe these two points over here, we'll be pretty much able to find the rotation, the relative rotation 
between these two frames. Uh, we'll see that we cannot find uh, T in this particular operation here. And it doesn't matter whether the camera has undergone ro uh, translation or not. It, it, in this case, it need not be a pure rotation, but uh, uh, we would still be able to find the rotation. So let's see how this is done. We, we have seen earlier on that the projection on the first image, for example, is going to be given by A multiplied by uh, I. Since we take this as in the canonical frame, I and zero. Uh, in this case here, we are going to multiply by X at infinity, which is given by the direction and zero, since this is an ideal point. Essentially, we saw that this is e equals to K multiplied by D, which is the direction. And hence, the direction here, D, can be denoted as uh, k inverse of v, which is what we have seen earlier on. Let's look at how this operation, the same operation, can be applied to the second view. Uh, we will get v prime, which is essentially the projection of the point at infinity onto the second frame. So this would be multiplied by k, r, and t, because there's a rotation and translation between the two views, but now uh, it's still the same point at infinity, so it's d0, and we can see that this is essentially equals to k multiplied by r and d. We will simply call this new direction of the line with respect to the second frame as d prime over here. Hence, we can rewrite this as d prime equals to k inverse of v prime. If, if we were to observe the vanishing points in both views, as well as uh, having a known intrinsic uh, of the camera, we'll be able to define D in the first view, the direction in the first view, uh, where we can also normalize this to become a unit vector by simply dividing it by the norm of that uh, of that vector that we have computed earlier on. So we'll do this, uh, we'll do the same thing for the second view where we'll get d prime over here. Since we know that uh, we, we can compute d and d prime here from k and v and v prime, which is observed from the image. So we, and we also know that, that we defined earlier on that d prime is simply equals to r multiplied by d in the, which is the direction of this uh, infinite point from the first frame. So this is d and this in the second frame, this is d prime. And they are both related by the rotation, uh, the rotation matrix. So essentially, we can see that since uh, this is a homogeneous uh, three by one uh, vector, where only the two values, the first two uh, entries are meaningful because the second, the, the last entry here is going to be, uh, so this is dx, this is dy, and the, the last entry here is going to be one. Hence this observation here, the observation of one vanishing point in one view is going to give us uh, two independent constraints, two constraints. And uh, we know that uh, for arbitrary rotation in general, there's three is three degrees of freedom, which is parameterized by the Euler angle, rho, pitch, and yaw. So uh, as a result, we will need at least three such constraints to solve for the three degrees of unknown in the rotation matrix. This can be simply obtained from two of these uh, corresponding vanishing points. So each one of these uh, V1 and V1 prime gives us one constraint, and then we will have just to look for another vanishing point, the, another corresponding vanishing point, V2 as well as V2 prime, to give us the second uh, constraint, and hence we can uh, then solve for the unknown rotation. Let's look at another example of uh, application of this uh, vanishing point. Uh, we can we have in fact seen this uh, many times. So a vanishing point is also a point on the image. So uh, what this simply means is that if I have two points on the image, let's call it V1 and V2. Uh, we have seen earlier on that if we know the camera, if we know the camera uh, intrinsics, which is K over here, uh, we can essentially define uh, this the direction of these two lines which is v1 and v2 and then we can pretty much uh, figure out the angle between this line theta over here which is given by this equation that we have seen uh, many times so uh, where k omega here is simply the k multiplied by k transpose inverse which is the image of the absolute conics and what this means is that uh, since vanishing point correspond to, to a line that uh, goes to a point at infinity 
these are the real scene lines. Uh, so what we can do here is that uh, we can you make use of this to figure out the angle between the two real scene lines. Now, uh, what I have spoken so far is on the assumption that uh, vanishing points are known. Together with the known intrinsic value, we can make, make use of it to compute the relative rotation between two uh, camera views, as well as we can make use of it to compute the angle between two scene lines. So, uh, but but the, the problem here is that uh, computing vanishing point itself is actually not that trivial, because this is actually a, a chicken and egg uh, problem. And uh, what I meant by chicken and egg problem is that, suppose that we are uh, given a set of lines that we know that is uh, parallel in the scene. They, are, they will have all to converge at one single point, which is uh, uh, the vanishing, which is the vanishing point over here. So all these are parallel lines, uh, supposed to be parallel line, but when you project it onto the image, it, it won't be parallel and it's going to be converging to one point. So suppose that if we, if we know where is the vanishing point, it will be easy to identify uh, which set of lines corresponds to this vanishing point. So uh, then the whole problem becomes very trivial. On the other hand, suppose that we know which set of parallel lines on the image when we extract the using line this uh, extractor. If we know the set of parallel, the line that should correspond to this vanishing point, then we will probably we, we will pretty much be able to compute the intersection of all these points of all these lines and get the vanishing point. But but the problem is that both of these entities, which is the vanishing point as well as which set of lines corresponds to the vanishing points are unknown. And what makes things worse is that the observation, the detection of the lines are often not perfect. So we can see this example here that uh, the detected line might not lie exact on the line that intersects perfectly at one, one single vanishing point. This is because uh, the imaging device, the camera, the photo sensor is actually uh, a, a real device that can be corrupted with noise. So the measurement is never going to be uh, that accurate. So now it becomes a chicken and egg problem. Uh, in order to find the vanishing point, we need to know the assignment of the lines that belongs to this uh, vanishing point. And on the other hand, we also need to know the vanishing point in order to know the assignment of the line. So, but in this case, we have to find both simultaneously. So I shall not go too much into the detail of uh, the how, how to compute the vanishing point, but I'll just give you some uh, references. Now, let's look at uh, the definitions of the vanishing line in a more uh, formal way. So suppose that we have a set of parallel planes in the 3D world. So this is a set of parallel planes. We say that this parallel plane, they're going to intersect at a line at a pi of infinity. So this is going to be the L at infinity, the infinite line on the plane at infinity. Suppose that we can capture an image of this, the intersection of any of this plane. With the plane of in, at infinity, and I, we will be able to capture what's known as the uh, vanishing line. What's known as the vanishing line over here. So this line is essentially the projection of the line at infinity, which is the intersection caused by the intersection of a plane and the plane at infinity. And uh, we're going to project this line onto this vanishing line, which we call the vanishing line. And this geometrically, this can be seen as the plane that is in the same direction, that is parallel to any arbitrary uh, plane uh, in the in the scene. Uh, that is that contains the camera center and the intersection of this particular plane it, with the image plane is what we define as the vanishing line from this geometry over here. We can also see that the vanishing line is only dependent on the normal direction of the plane as well as the camera center and the image location, but is independent on any location of this particular point in the real world scene, because this particular plane here, as long as it shares the same direction, they are parallel, uh, they are going all going to intersect at one line, one single line at the plane at infinity. So this line is going to be reprojected onto this vanishing line onto the image. Hence, uh, vanishing line depends only on the orientation of the same plane. It does not depend on the position. Since lines parallel to the plane intersects at the plane at infinity, the vanishing point 
of the lines parallel uh, to a plane must also lie on the vanishing point. So what this simply means is that let's say if I have a uh, the plane at infinity and I have a plane which I call pi over here. So if I extend this to infinity, this is going to essentially intersect at the line at infinity. So if I have any line here, if I have any parallel line that is uh, set of parallel lines that's parallel to this particular plane, uh, it could be in other directions as well. But let's look at first look at this direction. So what it simply means is that this is going to intersect at one point that sits on the line at infinity. And this set of li another line is actually octagonal to the normal direction of the plane. So this might intersect at another ideal point here, but it's still going to lie on the line at infinity. And all the parallel lines, all sets of possible parallel lines or octagonal to the normal direction of the plane. The, the intersection at, at infinity must all lie on this L at infinity. And hence, uh, the projection of this line at infinity would form the vanishing line. So this means that all the sets of parallel lines that is octagonal to the normal direction of the plane intersect at the ideal point that is reprojected onto somewhere on the vanishing line. Now let's look at three cases where uh, a known vanishing point as well as a known camera matrix can be used to find out uh, the information about the scene plane. In the first case, we will see that the plane's orientation relative to the camera can be determined directly from the known vanishing line as well as the known uh, camera intrinsic value. So earlier on in the lecture, we have seen that uh, given a line on the image plane, it back projects to a plane, which I denote by n over here. And the relation between this is given by the back projection is n transpose of the camera matrix intrinsic multiplied by L. So this essentially means that I can get the expression in terms of the line, uh, which is equals to k inverse transpose. Now, suppose that this L here is our vanishing line. If I know that this L here is the vanishing line of planes that are perpendicular to L. This means that I'm interested in this particular plane here, which is perpendicular to uh, L over here. Then we can conclude that a plane with the vanishing line has an orientation n equals to k transpose L, which is given by the back projection of this line uh, over here that we have seen earlier on in the lecture. In the second case here, we can see that a plane can be metrically rectified given only its uh, vanishing line. This is because since the plane normal direction is known from the van vanishing line, which is what we have seen earlier on. So suppose that uh, we have uh, the vanishing line over here. And now we know that if this is the camera center, the plane that is parallel in the world scene to this. So they are all defined by this normal vector over here. And we know that this is this same plane over here is going to intersect at the vanishing uh, line. Uh, v, this vanishing line, which we denote by L over here. Okay, so once we know this uh, and the camera intrinsic K, we pretty much can obtain this normal vector over here, uh, which is given by the back projection of L. And this is equals to K transpose of L, which both are known. So once we know this here, what we can uh, do here is that because this is a plane, this is a mapping of a plane to another plane, so uh, or which is the image uh, plane. So we know that the two must be related by a homography H. So what we can do here is that we can simply compute a homography that remaps this normal vector here into frontal parallel. That means that it has to point perpendicular to the image. And we can actually walk the scene into a frontal parallel scene of a new target image over here. The last case that we, are, we will look at on the use of a vanishing lines is that it can be used to determine the angle between two scene planes. So suppose that we have uh, two scene planes over here. One is denoted by N1, and then we have another uh, scene plane which is denoted by another normal vector here. So the back projection of L1 is going to be denoted by the normal vector of the plane, which is 
uh, parallel to the first scene plane and L2 here it's going to be N2 the back projection which is going to be parallel to this second plane over here so what we can do here is that we can make use of the uh, knowledge of this because we know N1 is equals to K transpose L1 N2 equals to K transpose L2 we can make use of this to form a dot product and uh, hence we can get the angle between these two uh, normal vector and uh, this would be the final expression that uh, can be derived I'll leave it to you to uh, to prove this and uh, next we'll look at how to compute the vanishing lines in the case of the vanishing line uh, it will be easier than computing the vanishing points computation of the vanishing lines would also require us to have a knowledge to first find what's the location of the vanishing points at least two vanishing points because the vanishing line would be simply the uh, defined by the cross product of uh, these two so l here would be equals to v1 cross v2 that we have uh, seen earlier on uh, in the first lecture finally let's look at some relationships between the vanishing points and lines especially when they are octagonal if i have a sim plane that intersects uh, with vanishing line that is projected onto the image at this direction and if i have another vanishing point which is uh, which comes from the scene line that is octagonal to this scene plane this particular vanishing point let me call this uh, l this vanishing line of this plane and the vanishing point of the parallel lines that is octagonal to this scene plane is going to define a vanishing point on the image and I know that the set of parallel lines uh, it's octagonal to the seam plane which defines the vanishing point and the vanishing line respectively and, and, and we know that any vanishing point that lies on this vanishing line which is perpendicular to the uh, first vanishing point which we call let's say we call this v1 and any vanishing point that we call v2 that is defined by the line that is parallel to the van to the the, the sim plane over here uh, it's going to be perpendicular and uh, this is going to be related by the relation here because uh, we saw that the dot product of the two directions is going to give us cosine 90 degree and that would be equals to zero and uh, we, we can see, derive this simply from the uh, from the this this kind of equations that we have seen many times in the in, in, in the lectures uh, this is the relation between two octagonal vanishing point suppose that I look at the one of the vanishing point that is octagonal to the vanishing line we have also see that uh, earlier on that this relation defines a pole polar relation because we, we can see that vanishing point and the vanishing line they're going to be related by the image of the absolute conics so we can bring this guy here uh, the inverse of this guy which is simply equals to the dual of the image of the absolute conics which, ha which you have seen earlier on and uh, to, to give this particular uh, relation and in fact the derivation of this is uh, similar to the, the polar relation that we have seen earlier on in the lecture in, in the case where two vanishing lines are perpendicular to each other that means that I have two planes in the image the one is uh, N1 and then the other one is uh, n2 for example these two planes is going to define two vanishing lines on the image uh, which is defined by l1 and l2 and we know that since this is the projection of two lines at infinity which are octagonal to each other and uh, the projection of this would be simply defined by this relation of the dual image of the absolute conics here which is uh, simply given by this equation here uh, when we because they are the two line L1 and L2 are octagonal so we are equating this to cosine 90 which is equals to zero and hence we get this uh, relation over here so finally we are going to uh, having defined all the polar relations as well as the octagonality relation between vanishing point and vanishing lines on vanishing point and van uh, another vanishing point we're going to look at an example where we can use uh, the knowledge of the vanishing line as well as the vanishing point 
to do a fine uh, 3D measurement. In particular, we are going to uh, we are going to look at a case where we can measure relative length of vertical segments of uh, uh, lines in the 3D world scene. Given the fact that we know where is the vanishing line and a vanishing point that is orthogonal to this vanishing line. So what this means is that if I have plane here that is given by the normal vector n, this plane is going to intersect the plane at infinity at a line l infinity. So this is going to intersect plane at infinity. And this line projects to this vanishing line over here, which I denote as l. And now I'm going to define another set of uh, lines that is parallel to the octagonal direction of this plane. And this is going to intersect the plane at infinity at a point at infinity, which I call uh, capital X infinity. And this is going to be projected onto the image uh, at the vanishing point, which is octagonal to this vanishing line. So given two, these two entities, uh, suppose that I have two segments on the ground plane, starting from the ground plane, I'll be able to measure the relative height. That means that I'm going to be able to take the ratio of this guy over this guy. And we'll see uh, how this can be done. So let's denote the vanishing line of the ground plane as L. So this ground plane here that we see is going to intersect the plane at infinity and at the uh, infinite line. This is going to project back onto the image as a vanishing line, which is denoted by L over here. And then these parallel lines, they're going to converge at the point at infinity, which is perpendicular to the line at infinity that we have saw earlier on. And this infinite point is going to reproject onto the image at the uh, vanishing point, which is denoted by V over here. Suppose that we know this, we are given L and V. And then uh, we are going given two segments that is uh, rested on the image plane. So we are going to define these two endpoints, the, the two pairs of endpoints of these two lines, L1 and L2 over here, as B1, T1, B2, and T2. So given the, the endpoints uh, denoted as small t1, t2, and small b1 and b2 on the image. So these are the four points that we are given. Based on this observation, v, l, t1, t2, b1, and b2, we want to compute the relative ratio of the l2 and l1 over here. The first step to do this would be to first compute a vanishing point on the vanishing line, where the vanishing point is actually given by the intersection of the line that joins B1 and B2. So I want to find this line as well as the line that the parallel line that is given by the starting from T1 intersecting at this point, which we are going to call T1 tilde over here, since they are both parallel to the plane. They are going to intersect at an infinite point that rests on the infinite line uh, that are uh, created by the intersection of this ground plane and the inf plane at infinity, which we call U over here. So the reprojection of this is going to lie on the line. And this can be easily found by uh, this equation over here. So essentially B1 cross B2 is this line over here. And then it will cross it with the line at infinity, which is given to us. So that will give us the point, which is U over here. Now, let's transfer uh, this point to T1 tilde over here. Let's figure out what's the projection of T1 tilde onto this, uh, onto the image. And this can be easily uh, obtained from the cross product of this line defined by T1. So since T1 and U are already known, we can easily uh, get the equation of the line, which is given by T1 cross with uh, U. And then uh, we can cross it with L2 over here. L2, this line over here to give us uh, this point over here. So L2 is simply given by B1, uh, sorry, B2 cross with V, uh, which is the vanishing point. And this is also known. So now we can, uh, now we've uh, found this and we have uh, also found this. Uh, values. So once these are once these are found, uh, let's look at just one of this line over here. Let's look at this particular line over here of interest, and then uh, we'll have four points on this line, which is given by B2, T1 tilde, T2 as well as V. So all these four points are known. So now we can denote this as a uh, as a one-dimensional uh, coordinate. Uh, given by uh, 0 and t tilde, t2 
as well as V. That's the length of these points on the line. And we know that this becomes a 1D projective transformation because everything is defined on the line. So what we want to uh, what we want to do here, uh, figure out a way to map the points. Since we have the line here, which is given by uh, so given by B2 B2 uh, T1 tilde T2 as well as V, which and V here is our vanishing point. So since we denote the first point as uh, 0, 1, and the last point here as V1, and we also know that this last point here is the uh, vanishing point at infinity, we can pretty much use this fact to figure out the mapping, the uh, homography, a 2 by 2 homography that maps the ground point in, uh, because since this is the origin, it should stay fixed at the origin uh, that maps it to itself. But we are going to also figure out the same homography that maps the uh, vanishing point to a uh, ideal point, which we denote by one zero. So zero here means that it's uh, going to be a point at infinity. And uh, this what this simply means is that we are going to figure out a homography that represents this line. Uh, that maps this line into the 3D line over here, where V here is now at point at infinity, denoted by 1, 0, which was given here. So we can sim easily figure this out. So if you have a 2 by 2 matrix and you want to map this onto itself, as well as mapping the point at infinity, the vanishing point to 1, 0, we can see that this is a very viable uh, solution. Once we found the homography, the 2 by 2 homography, we, we can then know that the, the this homography H2 by 2, it's actually a mapping between this line to the 3D line here. So now we can make use of the same homography to figure out the mapping of T2 as well as T1 tilde that is also resting on the line onto the 3D scene which we've seen earlier on that uh, this is H2 by 2 is given by 1, 0, 1 and minus V over here. We can pretty much compute the transformation of the T1 tilde and T2 tilde in the image coordinate into the 3D frame. So this is essentially given by 1, 0, 1 minus V multiplied by T1 tilde and 1. So this is going to give us T1 tilde in the 3D frame up to a certain scale. And then uh, we can see that this is going to give us T1 and as well as T1 tilde minus V. And uh, this is the first equation. So the second point that we are going to transform would be T2. And that's given by 1, 0, 1 minus V and uh, T2 tilde and 1. So this is going to map to T2 tilde and T2 tilde minus V over here. So uh, since we already know these two points, so T1 tilde is simply the distance between the ground, which is 0 over here, and T1 tilde would be simply D1. The distance between T, uh, this point and T2 would be simply D2. So is, uh, essentially, we'll just take the ratio of these two, and we can see that it's an expression that is given by these two coordinates that we have uh, found earlier on. Now, we can make use of this knowledge to measure the height of uh, people in the scene. If we know that uh, the, this is the vanishing line, a fixed vanishing line that we denote as L that we have seen earlier on here, this vanishing line, if we know this vanishing line here, uh, which we denote as L, and as well as we know that uh, these are the endpoints of some fixed segment. Say, for example, we just need to know one of the segments. If we know this particular line segment here, uh, we can have these points that is being fixed. So suppose that this is B1 and T1 that we have seen earlier on. Suppose that this is B1 and T1 that we have seen earlier on. And if we observe a person in the scene, we can actually draw a line from the person touching the ground and then uh, the head of the person. So we can denote this as, uh, we can observe this from the image, which we denote as B2 and T2. And we can make use of the same technique to find out the ratio of the length of this guy. Let's say this is 
D1 in the real scene, and this is D2 uh, in the in the real scene. We can actually make use of this to find out the ratio of D2 over D1 equals to some values that we can compute from the known vanishing line uh, as well as a vanishing point. We need to have uh, the vanishing point, which can be easy, easily computed by the intersection of, say, these two lines. Uh, and th that will give us a V, which is uh, probably out of the image. We can actually measure the height of the cabinet and keep it fixed because it will not change. And uh, so if we know this height, uh, and we can compute this ratio from the vanishing point, the known van uh, vanishing point, as well as the vanishing line. We can then determine the actual height of the person in the scene, which is uh, some two examples that's being shown here. We, we have seen several constraints that uh, is given by the vanishing points and vanishing lines. And this table shows uh, us a, a good summary of all the uh, uh, relationships of this, the, the vanishing points and vanishing lines and how it can be used, how this relation can be used to calibrate a unknown uh, camera. So uh, in comparison with uh, what we have seen earlier on that uh, uh, in the previous example that we are making use of the known uh, calibration matrix as well as the as well as the vanishing point and vanishing line to determine the scene uh, pro geometric properties. But now, let's say uh, K is unknown. Uh, we can actually figure out what's K here in the conics. So we have seen this equation earlier on that two octagonal vanishing point is constrained by this equation over here. Since this is a one by one uh, equation, this is this means that there's one constraint over here. We can actually make use of at least five of these constraints to compute the omega over here which can be decomposed into k uh, the the k matrix we can similarly we can also make use of the uh, octagonal relation between a vanishing line and a vanishing point to define this uh, uh, equation so this is essentially obtained from the pole polar equation which is uh, this guy over here and uh, the, which means that the cross product of this l cross with omega v it will be equals to zero and this is linear so each one of these will give us two constraints and we can make use at least three of this line and point relation to define uh, the, the set of constraints which we can stack into uh, the relation of a w equals to zero and solve for w where a here it's derived from l the known l and v so similarly we have seen uh, from the calibration example that uh, with the three squares we can define, we can compute the homography, and then each square gives us two uh, constraints. So altogether, we need to image three square concurrently in order to give us six constraints that solve for the five unknowns in omega. So further uh, knowledge can also be obtained if we know that the camera uh, intrinsics contains zero skew. This means that the S here is zero. So uh, in this particular case here, we if you uh, take this and multiply it uh, into omega, we can see that W12 and W21 equals to zero. So this will give us a further one more constraint on the equations over here. And if we further uh, make the assumption that this is a square matrix, which means that the focal length in both directions are equal and there's a zero skew, then we can further make uh, another uh, set of uh, equations over here, another uh, constraint. So by doing this, we have all together two constraints which can use at least together with other combinations of the vanishing points or lines, the octagonality constraint or the homography, we can make use of this to calibrate, find all the unknowns in the, in the camera intrinsics. And uh, as I've explained earlier on, so the, uh, we can make use of any combinations to get the internal constraints, rearrange this omega into a six by one vector, since only the first six elements here are unique, because this should be a, a symmetric uh, metric. And since all these constraints here gives us a linear constraint, so any of the constraint can be rearranged into a dot product of a transpose multiplied by w equals to zero as long as we have a uh, as long as we have more or equal, uh, equals to five constraint because there are five unknowns here in this con uh, image of the absolute conic and as long as we have more than five we can restack this into a w equals to zero and use svd to solve for uh, the unknown w where 
once we solve for the unknown W, we can use a Kolosky factorization to factorize this guy here into the K matrix over here. And hence, we'll be able to determine, uh, since the Kolosky uh, decomposition will give us a, a lower uh, or upper uh, triangular matrix, which corresponds to the K matrix, we can determine exactly what are the entries in the uh, camera intrinsic value. So in summary, uh, what we have looked at in today's lecture is that we have looked at the actions of the camera projections on plane lines, conics, as well as uh, quadrics, the forward and backward projection. And then we have uh, explained the respective effect on the images on the images uh, for a fixed camera center, increased focal length, as well as pure rotation. Then uh, next we have looked at the the definition of the image of absolute conics. And then uh, we look at how to make use of this uh, to do camera intrinsic calibration. Finally, we define vanishing point and vanishing line and then use them to find the geometric properties of the scene as well as the camera. Thank you.